when I was lining up against all the women on the starting line of the trials, it was incredible because I was like, every single woman had their ups and downs to get here. Every single person has a story. Every single person has worked really hard to make this goal happen for themselves. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 190. We are getting so close to the 200. 190 of the Running Field podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Actually, you won't be joining me, but thank you for being here today. I am excited that you will be listening to this episode and that you are tuning in right now, whether this is your first time listening because you are a huge fan of my guest today or you are a huge fan of my guest host today. Either way, welcome. If you are a loyal listener, welcome back. I hope you are going to enjoy this one. Now, my friends, as I have kind of given away, I am not interviewing in this episode. I am not the host. Last week, if you listened to the episode with Sarah Crouch, getting to know her and her story and what she's been up to since 2019, which has been a lot, uh, you would have heard that I kind of passed over the reins. I'm not doing these four episodes in a row. I am spreading them out. There's one or two each month while I'm while I am gone. But today is the first episode. Sarah Crouch will be the guest host. And I'm excited that it is with our mutual friend, Neely Spence Gracie. Uh, Sarah and I have both known Neely probably maybe 13 years now at this point. <laughs> We've all known each other from Division 2. We, we all ran in college together. And uh, we've, I don't know, it's just been kind of fun watching each other grow over the years. And uh, I'm excited that Sarah chose Neely as um, her first guest, because I think Neely has, you know, come such a long way. She's achieved a lot, but she's also really, you know, grown as a person. And, you know, she's a lovely, wonderful person as as she was, but she's also learned to kind of be vulnerable and admit things that she's struggling with and and her transition into parenthood maybe wasn't as easy as you as she thought it might be which you will hear about today but I am excited for you to to get to hear Sarah as an interviewer I think she does a a fantastic job and she really is gonna maybe want to challenge me for giving back this mic I should keep that in mind maybe I should say she's doing a terrible job no not really just kidding But friends, I am actually on maternity leave right now. As I am recording this, I have no idea whether my baby is already here by now. I would imagine it probably is, but um, I don't know. (laughs) Either way, I am on maternity leave. I'm taking three months totally off uh, work, so I have no idea what the world looks like at this point. But I am excited for you to hear this episode with Neely Spence Gracie and Sarah Crouch. So we'll take a quick moment to thank our sponsors and then we'll be right to the episode. Thank you to my wonderful sponsor, Athletic Greens, for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Your Podcast. Now, I know we hear the term supplement, we hear the term, you know, multivitamin, and we kind of shut off, don't we? We we think it's just going to be talking about this generic thing, you know, you could get in in a bottle of pills from this grocery store. But I'm telling you, friends, I believe in Athletic Greens so much. I took it the entire way through my pregnancy as my prenatal vitamin because I believed in it so much with the 75 vitamins, minerals and whole food source ingredients that work together to help the body absorb and synthesize nutrients in a highly bioavailable form. It is the first thing I do every morning is put a scoop of Athletic Greens into 12 ounces of water. Yes, I do like a bit more water than they recommend. And that's just kind of, I like to have it as a first drink of the day. I will drink it down while I write in my journal. I do a gratitude journal and kind of write some thoughts out about how I'm feeling. And that is my routine every single morning. I believe in this product so much. It has boosted my energy, given me mental clarity, supported my immunity during this time that I needed it the most. And I am just so thankful for this product. And I think I... I know that if you give it a try, you will be too. There are many of you who have added it to your routines as well and have noticed the difference, have said there's no going back for you either, just as there is no going back for me. And I'm just excited to hear that. So you can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get 20 servings for free. That's a $79 value. So 20 servings for free by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. I absolutely love this product and I know you will too. 
All right. Welcome to the Running for Real podcast. As you can tell from my voice, I am not your usual host, Tina Muir. I am your guest host, Sarah Crouch, and I will be hosting the next four episodes of the podcast. So I wanted to start things off with a bang, and I have brought on the absolutely fabulous uh, Neely Spence Gracie. So Neely and I have known each other for a long time. Um, She has a very, very hearty resume of running times from everything from a 1525 5k all the way up to 234 in the marathon. Um, I think arguably her most impressive time is 69.55 and the half, which for those of you who can't run the math, which is all of us, that is 520 <laughs> per mile for 13 miles in a row. So um, Neely's had a very impressive career. And also uh, in more recent history, she has become a mother to a beautiful little boy named Athens. And she uh, reached her Olympic trials qualifying standard at the Houston Marathon marathon in January. So it's been a beautiful journey for Neely. But for those of you who maybe don't know um, Neely or haven't listened to a podcast with her before, I'd love for her to give, um, well, first Neely, welcome. I should say that. Hi, it's good to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing a great intro. I have not (laughs) talked about myself. (laughs) Just listen to you talk about me. I appreciate it. Let's just do that for the whole podcast. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) No, I did want to talk about, because obviously, um, you know, you and I raced a hundred years ago back in D2 in college. Um, But between uh, then and, and you getting pregnant, it was what, like seven or eight years probably of running professionally, maybe a little more? Yeah, I started my pro career in 2012. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I guess I got pregnant at the end of 2017. So I had, yeah, I guess that's five years, five and a half years of running professionally. Mm-hmm. And I still run and train. Um, and I'm sponsored by Adidas. And so, yeah, it's been uh, quite a journey and it's been weird. Um, not racing for so long because I couldn't because I was pregnant and taking care of a, a, a young baby. And then I finally got back to racing in January um, of this year. And I was so excited for the year. And now we're back to not racing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And and in that time, you know, before becoming pregnant, obviously you had a lot of um, really big career highlights. You were the top American in Boston. Um, you had several really, really good national championship races. Um, and then of course, getting pregnant, I'm going to ask you something that I don't know if I'm allowed to ask, but I'm a guest host. Tina can't fire me. So, um, <laughs> was Athens, was this something that was, that was planned for you and Dylan? It was, um, so 2017, I had, just come off of running, um, you know, the the Boston marathon in 2016, the New York marathon in 2016. Um, and I was super excited. I felt like things were really going, uh, the direction I was hoping. And I wanted to kind of revisit some of that speed work. Um, so in 2017 for that spring, I really focused on trying to like rebuild that turnover because I just spent two like an entire year, you know, two seasons doing marathon training blocks. And so I did a bunch of smaller, um, shorter races, uh, the spring of 2017 with the goal of trying to win a national title because I, uh, have yet to accomplish that. So (laughs) it didn't happen. Um, I was third at one race, um, and second at two others that spring, And so, you know, it was fine. I missed my goal, but I had accomplished what I wanted in that I had, you know, really worked on my speed. I felt like it was in a good place and I was excited to try the marathon again and, you know, go for that sub 230, which was, I felt right there for me, um, with the fitness that I had gained, uh, over the past year. And then I started to have some foot issues that summer and I just couldn't shake it. Um, and so after a few months of it, I was just so frustrated and so like emotionally destroyed and realized like I've been doing this, you know, training seriously for 14 years. Um, and I was just at the point where I was, I was like, I need something different. Like I, right now, you feel that something physically and mentally you needed something Mm -hmm. different or was it? Okay. Yeah. 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 It was definitely both, um, aspects and, um, my sister, uh, told me that she was pregnant and I was like, all right, that's it. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> so <laughs> babies, um, rabies is what we call that. It's very, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and it like, it was a good time of year because, um, 2018 was an off year for those of you who don't know what that means. Um, in the pro world, 
uh, we use those off years to have babies and <laughs> to do um, <laughs> other things because there's not a world championship and there's not an Olympics. And so it was kind of like great timing. Um, and my husband and I kind of talked to me like, okay, you know, we'll try for a few months and if not, I'll run Boston. And like, either way I'll be working towards a goal. And so, um, we tried, got pregnant pretty quickly and, um, yeah, that I, it feels like a long, long time ago. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure it does, but I'm sure in the moment, especially with pregnancy in that the beginning, it seems just sort of creep by. And I have to ask, like, how was running for you in that, in that first trimester, especially because most women don't feel great. Yeah. I felt terrible. Um, (laughs) I, (laughs) I won't sugarcoat that for sure. Um, so I thought that I would be that person that like loved being pregnant. Like having kids is always something that I've wanted. And I was so excited to be like fulfilling that goal and that dream of mine. And I severely underestimated so many parts of it. So Mm -hmm. I would say the first thing was before I even found out I was pregnant, I found out at six weeks and before I even found out I was like struggling so much with running. Mm -hmm. Um, like I remember so clearly doing like a five mile run and we were running up like a slight grade and maybe like seven minute pace. And I was like race breathing, like (laughs) could barely get to the top of this hill, um, on like just an easy five mile run. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm in like way worse (laughs) shape than I was (laughs) thinking I was in. Um, And then the week after I found out I was pregnant, um, I went for a long run and I was so exhausted. I took three naps that Mm -hmm. day and my run was only 13 miles, which when I'm in full training, that's like a normal run day. So it was like, (laughs) I I was just like, yeah, my body is not handling this well. Um, and then I really struggled with like sickness from like eight to 12 weeks. That month was just really challenging for me. So yeah, I wasn't able to run it a lot. I didn't do or try to do really any workouts because I was struggling. And then, um, I actually had to stop running at 18 weeks into my pregnancy because I was having such bad, like low back pain, oh, really? uh, like a side wow. joint stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So my, my pregnancy was not at all what I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and in terms of, cause obviously there's, there's the, the hormonal and, and how you feel and all that, but then it's mm-hmm. also another thing to have been in obviously peak physical shape for all these years. And then to see your body change, was that hard for you at all? Like, did you find yourself resistant to it or did you embrace that when it happened? I tried really hard to embrace it because I knew it's what needed to happen. Um, and I felt terrible if I didn't take care of myself. So, um, like I had to eat and I could not stomach very many foods at all. So I've always heard about people who have, you know, all these pregnancy cravings and it's like weird combinations of gross things. And for me, it was the opposite. It was like, I had all these aversions, but like nothing sounded good but if I didn't eat, I would feel so sick and terrible. And so I literally just carried like my thing, like the only thing I could handle was I would make myself like a little, um, charcuterie tray of (laughs) grapes. Fancy. I love it. (laughs) Or you could call it, you know, like a five-year-old's meal, but it was great. Charcuterie tray sounds way better. Cheese and crackers. Oh, grapes man. and cheese and crackers. And I just had to carry it around and I could never be hungry and I could never be full. And as long as I wasn't ever hungry or full, and I just like had a grape, a che- piece of cheese and a cracker every 20 minutes, then I was fine. Um, so oh, that was like how I got through that month. And my husband was like, so weirded out. Um, <laughs> sure. and he like, I couldn't have him cook. Like I couldn't smell anything in the house. So like he had to eat only things that like did not need to be heated up. Like the smell of meat. I couldn't yeah. eat meat for my entire pregnancy. Like I felt wow. awful. I couldn't eat vegetables, like all these things that I normally eat every day. It was crazy. Um, so that was really strange to me just because like, it was something I had no control over. Mm-hmm. And then I, yeah, I had heard all these like, you know, Oh, you know, you barely like, can even tell you're pregnant the first trimester. Like no one else would really know. I was like, I gained like over 20 pounds in the first trimester. My body was so freaked out. 
And it kind it kind of like slowed down a little bit after that, but I definitely was like on the high end and my OB was great. Cause she was like, my biggest concern with runners is like, they don't gain enough weight. And they're like, so obsessive about mm-hmm. trying to keep like in shape and all this stuff that like, they don't take care of themselves or their body or the baby. Right. And so she's like, you're doing a great job, you know, but every time I go in, I was just like, I can't even look like this is terrible, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I remember like my last weigh in, I was like 160 something and I was like, okay, wow. Like that's, I've gained at least 50 pounds. And so I, I definitely had a, a more challenging and again, not at all what I was expecting, um, pregnancy when it came to that. And so I don't know, like I tried really hard to embrace it and I tried to be okay with it. And there were times where I was, and then there are times where I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I have to imagine too, that, um, you kind of go one way or the other, and it's hard with you being a running coach. You can't really separate yourself from the running world. And during that time, obviously there's changes in technology. We were seeing records fall, new faces come on the scene, old Mm -hmm. faces leave. Like, did you ever struggle with feeling, um, you know, that saying it's like, okay, you're only as good as your last race. Like that, that feeling of I'm no longer relevant. Like, did that ever, uh, did that bother you? You know, I spent my entire pregnancy trying to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. Um, that was something that I really focused on and I don't know if I did a good job or not, but to me, it was important because one Adidas was still sponsoring me and they were still supporting me. And I wanted to stay relevant so that I felt like I deserved the sponsorship and that they were getting the credit that they, you know, earned by, um, you know, continuing to support me, even though I wasn't racing and training at the time. And so I started, uh, writing articles for women's running. I started writing articles for runners world. I tried to have a, you know, continued presence on social media. I built up my clientele, um, with my coaching business. So that was something that was important to me because I actually, there was no point where I wanted to take a step back from the sport. I still was very focused on helping my clients with their training. I was living vicariously through everyone else who was still running, um, (laughs) It's just that I knew my body needed a break from it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would say that was like a really big thing for me was trying, trying to figure out how to stay relevant, how to stay up to date with everything that was going on. And like, I was at Boston that year when Desi won and it Mm. was like terrible weather and all the stuff sitting there on my birthday um, (laughs) being like, God, really like this would have been my year. Like I thrive in terrible conditions, you know, like you and I raced in so many bad crappy (laughs) events. Exactly. Yeah. And I remember like when we had nationals and me, Oh, what it was in California. Oh, 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 okay. Um, the California race. Oh yeah. Well, Louisville where it snowed, And then, um, California, we had that track, Mm -hmm. uh, race and it was like pouring rain and we're all warming up on the treadmills, like before the event, (laughs) you know, like I've run in all kinds of crappy stuff. And like, I always like rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. I always think that's like my, my secret is like, okay, like, you know, I'm not super like time trially fast. But if it's bad weather, like I can make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there, you know, watching Boston unfold and I'm like, oh my God, like I, I could have, that could have been my race. Like, you know, I don't think I would have beat Desi because, you know, Desi was uh, on fire and she totally, she, she was the queen that day for sure. But it would have been a nice $75,000 paycheck. I know, exactly. (laughs) And I was like, like this, this would have been so cool. And that had always, always been my plan. Like I'll debut at Boston Mm -hmm. in 2018 on my birthday. Um, and then like many series of events changed. I debuted two years earlier, you know, all this stuff, but you know, so that was really hard. Um, but it was also really exciting to watch and like very inspiring. So I feel like I've had so many like very exciting and inspiring times. And right now, like if I had to fast forward, you know, because my last competitive season was, um, 2017. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're coming up on nearly three years 
And I don't really consider the spring or winter being a competitive season um, because it was still so far off of what I've done in the past. But right now I'm at a point where I'm like, my mind is back in the like competitive, excited, like fired up and ready to go mentality, which is so nice because I thought like, what if that never comes back? And I remember being you right now, you know, (laughs) like in the middle of my pregnancy and being like, yeah, like it seems like a completely different life. And like, I was a completely different person and am I am ever going to be that person again? Yeah. And I do have to say, it's like, I've had the same thoughts you've had, especially about sponsorship. And it, it does make me wonder. So you've been with Adidas for a couple of years now, right? A little while it's been. A, yeah, yeah. It'll be five years in August. Yeah. So, so with that, you know, we look at, let's take a, a different kind of job. Like let's say a school teacher, they get their maternity leave, you know, they don't work at all during their maternity leave and then they come back to their job and it seems very standard. But for some reason with athletes, we feel this sort of pressure of like, I still need to perform. I still need to earn this job because I, and I, I'm not sure, really sure why that is. I wanted to pick your brain on that or why, why do we feel that sort of guilt when it comes to our, our sponsorship when we're not running? Although every other job in the world, you know, they've, they earn that maternity leave rightly, you know? Yeah, it's super interesting. And I feel like over the past year and a half or so, a lot of this type of discussion has started to come up that was never even in question, you know, previously. I remember so clearly when I got pregnant, you know, it was thrilling. I was so excited. And then I called my agent and completely lost my mind, like bold hysterically. And I was like apologizing. And I'm like, what am I apologizing for? Like, you know, I'm literally doing one of my life dreams right now. Like I have goals as a runner and I have goals for life. And this is one of my big life goals. And I remember just being like, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, I, I feel so bad, but like we had planned this. It wasn't like a complete accident. It wasn't, you know, like something I didn't want. I, but I still felt guilty. And so, and my agent was amazing. He was like, Neely, stop crying. Like, what is wrong with you? (laughs) Like, this is the most like amazing thing you're ever going to do in your whole life is be a parent. So we are so excited for you. Congratulations. Like, don't worry about anything. Mm. And that was really reassuring. But then I was like, well, I know like I'm done. Like I know Adidas is not going to keep me on. Like, why would they? Mm -hmm. And then like a few months later, um, at Boston, actually (laughs) that year in, in 2018, I met my quote boss at Adidas and he was like, gave me a hug. Congratulations. We're so excited for you. Make sure you don't rush back to anything. Like it was so incredible. And I remember like being like, okay, if they would just like suspend me, that would be great. So that like my job would still be there. Like they don't have to pay me for the time I'm not running, but like, at least my job would be there as an option, you know, whenever I get back to it. And then I remember thinking like, okay, well maybe if they would just pay me like 50% of what my norm is, like that would be incredible. And now I look back on that and I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, how was that normal? How was that like best case scenario in my mind? Yeah. Because I thought that they were just going to be like, peace, see ya. Like, bye. Yeah. Um, So, and this was all before, you know, all of this dream maternity stuff came out. Um, So they were kind of ahead of the curve, which was like really amazing and um, something that I'm very proud of. Um, And then, you know, as the years have gone on, like there has been multiple times where I'm like, well, I've hit a year now and I still haven't raced. So like, they're definitely not going to sign me again. And then they're like, we got you. Like, let's get excited for next year. And like those goals. And I'm like, what? (laughs) And you know, again, this year it was the same thing where I was like, okay, like, I think I have it in me to qualify. Like, this is a big goal. I really want to get after it. I want to qualify for the trials it'll be my third like time qualifying for the trials. And that it just feels really special to me. Um, and they were like, we support you. Let's do this. I'm like, wow. Okay. So <laughs> really? <good."> like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been like shocked over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, and so, but I think that there's a few different aspects of this, you know, circling back to your question. And that is, 
you know, one, we're paid to do a job. So we sign these contracts and the contracts say things like, if you don't race eight times every year, like we can fire you. And so to us, it's like all performance based, Mm -hmm. but what is different now than when you and I first graduated college is that there's social media and our presence is still known and our presence on these platforms is still valued. And so we do provide value to, um, our companies and to our sponsors. Um, even if we're not racing, because you know what, like how many times with the exception of when you and I led Boston for a while, (laughs) how many times do we actually get on the TV? You know, like, eh, mm, not really. (laughs) Um, so not many people are going to see us, even if we are racing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think that there is, uh, something to be said for kind of how things have shifted there. Mm -hmm. And we've become, instead of just icons on the track or on the road for a company, we've become influencers through social media. And we, every time I have to fill out one of those dumb forms and they're like, what is your job? And I'm like, Oh God, you know, that's complicated. (laughs) Like this is not a very common thing. Um, I scroll down and I click marketing because I'm like, that's what I do. I market for Adidas. Thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Now, Tracksmith is a Boston-based brand led by a group of runners who are committed, and I mean committed, to making classically stylish, cutting-edge apparel. Their goal is simple. Craft the most considered products on the market for runners dedicated to the personal pursuit of excellence. And I'm not just talking about those who are chasing sub three in the marathon or even chasing a Boston qualifier, you know, chasing sub 20 in the 5k. I'm not just talking about the top level. This is anyone who has a a love for the sport. And the word amateur comes from the Latin word for lover. And in that sense, we're, we're all amateurs. And this love kind of, we see it come out in so many ways within runners. We see that dedication that runners give, the getting up so early in the morning, the squeezing runs in anytime, the running around parking lots when you don't have any other option. We runners really dedicate ourselves to the sport and we deserve something to go with it to help us to make that journey better. Tracksmith designs all their products to solve the kind of problems that amateur runners face, whether that's a breathable long sleeve shirt that can be reworn without washing, or the perfect shorts to go with your long run with room for your keys, phone and fuel. Trexmith is the one that sweats the details so you don't have to. Now I've been telling you each week about something that I've really been enjoying and today I want to tell you about the turnover tights. Now when it comes to body wear, runners need materials that fit close to their skin without restricting our range of motion. Trexmith's turnover tights use their Italian made Inverno blend. It's a speciality knit with smooth yet durable face that fends off light precipitation and a soft brushed back that provides a barrier between you and the fabric to improve your temperature regulation. Pretty cool, huh? That also speeds our drying times. You will never feel a running tight like these. They are so comfortable. I absolutely love them. I've even been able to wear them in the later stages of pregnancy because they just fit so well and they can work around that. If they can work around a third trimester bump, they can definitely work with everyone listening here today. So you can get 15% off your first order if you are brand new to Tracksmith by going to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina Muir. That's T-R-A-C-K-S-M-I-T-H dot com forward slash Tina Muir. That's T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R. If you enter code Tina, you will get 15% off your first purchase. There is a reason so many of you been going have been going for this lately. You get it. You see the special in this brand and I truly do too. I can't wait to hear what you think. We've become, instead of just icons on the track or on the road for a company, we've become influencers through yeah, social yeah. media. And we, every time I have to fill out one of those dumb forms and they're like, what is your job? And I'm like, oh God, you know, that, that's complicated. <laughs> like, this is not a very common thing. Um, I scroll down and I click marketing because yeah. I'm like, that's what I do. I wow. market for Adidas. And you know, and with that in mind, it, it's almost arguably more valuable for you to have gone through 
the last two years of what you've gone through, because that makes you how many women runners do we know that have had children? Thousands. It makes you then extremely relatable. It bridges that gap between, you know, Neely, the 69 minute half marathoner and Neely, someone who went through a really, really rough pregnancy and year after, you know? Um, yeah, that's so true. And then, so looking forward then, cause I've heard you mentioned before that you'd like to eventually have, you know, another child. Is that something that you think you'll approach differently, like with less guilt going into to building your family? I have to ask that, you know, like in terms yeah. of how you handled it this time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting story because the day that I was allowed to get an IUD after having Athens, I did. Um, and not only, not only did I get an IUD, but I got the one that lasts 10 years. Oh, so wow. I'm pretty good to go for a while. Um, I love being a mom and I love Athens to death. Um, but I don't think that my career and my sanity can handle, Mm -hmm. um, a second, uh, with the way that I parent, um, and everyone's different in that regard. And it's important for everyone to do what's best for them and for their family. Um, and for me, what is best for us is, to not have another child until I feel like I've accomplished things that I want to accomplish. You know, I hear so many people pre children saying, I want three, I want four. And then after one, they're like, yeah, we're done. Um, (laughs) so I think, I think that's fairly normal. Um, and maybe some of that has to do with, you know, parenting, maybe some of it has to do with like the birth experience. And I have wondered, you know, and I've talked to a lot of women about this because I do work in the, in the birth world as well. But did you feel like that your birth experience had a lasting impact on you as a runner? And do you think it will over the next couple years. I'd love to, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Well, I would say for me, the biggest thing was pregnancy. That was, that was, that's the number one thing that, um, will be the hardest for me when we go to have a second is having to go through pregnancy again. Um, I had so much anxiety, so much stress. And because I couldn't run, I didn't have a way to release that. And so I think it just kind of spiraled and I hope that maybe my body will handle a second pregnancy better because we'll have remembered, um, the first go around, but you never know. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those people that was like sick the whole time. And so just like lots of things, my birth actually was great. I have an OB, um, who is a runner. And so that I think made the biggest difference for me. She was so supportive and so understanding and so helpful, And her big goal was like, okay, we do not want you to have to have a C-section. We want to have as least traumatic experience birthing Athens as possible so that your body can recover. And so she actually wasn't even working the day that I went into labor. Mm. And, you know, you have those like three OBs and they like all, you know, rotate and you have to meet each one just in case and blah, blah, blah. Well, it turned out, you know, she wasn't there. And so I got in and I actually had like a, a doula mm. who is a good friend of mine and she is a labor and delivery nurse as well. And so I called her and she came in and she actually is friends with the OB called her and my OB came in on her day off and delivered. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. It was like so reassuring. It was amazing. Like everything turned out really well and you know, yeah, labor was really hard and awful. And six hours in Athens started to have, um, some heart rate issues. And so that was getting a little bit scary and they had to stop labor and like slow my contractions down. And it turned out he just had a short cord and, Mm -hmm my pelvic floor was too strong and wouldn't let him come through. And so it was like, he was in this like tug of war inside my body. Oh my gosh. Once, once we got everything calmed down and once I got an epidural at six hours in and I was able to like relax Mm -hmm. and just like let gravity kind of work for a little while, then my, the rest of my labor was much better. I did push for like two hours and didn't tear at all. Mm, that's and great. Came out happy, healthy, seven pounds, five ounces, one week early. Mm-hmm. And so it was awesome. It was, it was great. I had such a good experience. Um, yes, that's great. And so that part is not as scary to me next time around. 
Wow. It's so weird. You usually hear the opposite of people like, oh, yeah, I love being pregnant, but like labor, you know. Um, but, you know, that really does make more sense as an athlete because it's like your whole job is managing pain. Really, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's like that you can do. But when you're faced with like constant nausea from morning till night, it's like that's a whole yes. other ball game. <laughs> so um, exactly. I know you waited that like standard six weeks to start running. But like I've always mm-hmm. wondered how that's going to feel like. Did your body feel totally foreign, like returning from yes. pregnancy? In what ways did it feel weird? So I had never in my entire life from the time I started running in eighth grade taken off that amount of time from running. So I took off six months of running. And when I did my first run after the six weeks after having Athens, I did 10 by run a minute, walk a minute. And Dylan ran with me and pushed the stroller beside me because I had too much anxiety to not be within eyesight of Athens at all times. And so he was amazing. Um, I have to give him a shout out for that because the first two months of Athens life, he literally pushed the stroller beside me every single run so that I could see him because I was like, I didn't want to leave him to go run. So that was very amazing. But yeah, I felt so weird and I got back and a friend of mine was like, how was your run? And I was like, everything is jiggling. <laughs> that, was, that was my response. I That's what like, my sister said at first. So she's weird. like, yeah, she's like, it literally felt like everything was going to fall out. Like, that's yeah. what she said. man, I was like, it was so strange, but it was also so amazing. And I think I took it so slow the first month because I did walk run in this really slow transition back that I never hit a point where I was like, Oh, you know, running feels terrible or, Oh, like I can't keep going because I always had this built in walk break. And then I just slowly added a minute of running each time. Mm -hmm. And so it took me like a month till I ran like 20 minutes straight through. And then it took me like another month to work up to like four miles straight through. And so then I kind of like was able to build from there but I, it wasn't, I didn't do any workouts for like the first six months. Um, and I think that was really helpful because I never hated running. Um, running was always something that I had like was so excited to do and something that I really looked forward to because I was able to take it so slow and I didn't feel like I had to rush or force anything. Yeah. It's crazy because when you think if you add it all up, that really means you went a full year without doing like mm-hmm. any sort of quality, like any sort of speed. Um, which is astounding considering how far you've come back since then. But I know between then and now you've gone through uh, several injuries, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at that point at the the six month mark, I was like, all right, like I'm committed. Let's get back to this. I want to race again and all this stuff. And when I started incorporating that speed work, my body still was not ready for the speed work. I think I probably needed another couple months of like just building up my volume and my strength. And I think that came from just being off for so long that I think I underestimated how long it would take to rebuild a base uh, when, yeah, you've taken basically a year off from (laughs) anything of substance. And I also was viewing it as an injury. I was like, this is the only thing I can relate it to was like, okay, I had knee surgery, you know, in 2014, I took four months off. I got back into running and I had a successful return to run because I did this. So I'm going to do something similar. The difference that I now know is that when you're coming off of a pregnancy and having a baby and everything, it is not like an injury. When you come back from an injury, you're still your same person as you were pre-injury. When you come back after having a baby, you are not the same at all. Like you are a completely different person. And so learning what that person needs and how that looks is much more challenging because it's so different to each individual. Um, and around the time I started trying to do speed work, Athens started teething. And so he stopped sleeping. And so he was like a great sleeper for the first six months. And I was like, Oh my God, we got so lucky. This is amazing. Um, and then he like didn't sleep for like six months after that. So that was really challenging. Um, so then I was losing recovery while I was trying to like ramp up training and we had a lot of bad weather. And so I was stuck inside on the treadmill or, uh, like doing loops in my neighborhood. So I like lost the ability to run on soft surfaces and there was, there's just like a whole like 
chain of events. Um, but ultimately my body just was not quite ready for it. And I was hoping it would be (laughs) where, where were you at mentally during that time? Yeah, it was really tough when, um, so it first started with shin splints, um, (laughs) which again, I was like, I had shin splints in high school. Like this is not an injury that I'm familiar with at like a professional level because I have had enough years of pounding that my, you know, shins have adjusted and adapted. And like, it wasn't even like, it took me a long time to even figure out what was going on because I didn't even understand like what the injury was. And it's interesting because I've actually heard that that's a really common injury coming back after having a baby, because when you're holding a baby in front of you and adjusting the weight shift, like your calves are kind of right. Like your calves are taking on a lot more of the load. And so it actually, from what I've heard is kind of like a common thing to have Mm -hmm. because of just the change, um, of carrying yeah. around a kid all the time. Yeah. Um, and then I think also, you know, the, the extra weight added to it because my body is not quite used to that, like pounding with like that extra load. And then again, I think it was just like the speed where I wasn't quite strong enough to handle the, the speed work. So I had to do a lot of resets and mentally it was really hard because I was like, I've like, been so cautious. And I like spent those first six months doing everything right. Like why is my body not cooperating? And so, yeah, like mentally it was really hard. And there were a lot of times where I was like, is this just not even worth it anymore? Like, but the thing that I kept like coming back to is like running is still so important to me and running is still such a like key part of my day and my happiness and my joy. And like, I I know that if I have joy and excitement when it comes to running and training that I'm like not ready for it to stop. And so that was kind of like the, that was like the only thing I could hold on to. It was like, okay, like just got to keep going. Like at some point your body is going to respond. And like, it was a few months and then my shins started to come around and I was like, yes, this is great. Um, and right around the time I started weaning Athens because I was like, okay, like things are starting to click. I was starting to do track workouts. I was starting to feel pretty good. I was getting closer to that, like pre baby weight. And I was, uh, doing a, a negative split run. So it was like a 14 mile negative split. So each mile I was trying to get just a little bit faster so that by the end I was like cranking pretty good. And it's one of my favorite workouts. And I, I like run uphill for the first like half of it. And then I turn around and I run (laughs) downhill for the second half. So it like, (laughs) you know, it gives me that little boost at the end. And I was like cranking and I was starting to feel pretty good. And I was one mile from my house and I felt this like stabbing pain in my hip. And I was like, Oh my God, what was that? And I like kind of just slowed down and like shuffled home and I couldn't walk like after that. Um, and turns out when I was weaning Athens, the relaxin hormone that is associated with, uh, having a baby and breastfeeding had like gone away because I had stopped nursing and my hips were like over tightening. And in the shift of my hips tightening back up and like moving back into position, because after having a baby, my hips were like pointed in two opposite directions and they were like not going the direction they needed to go. Um, and so when they shifted back, uh, it just put so much stress that I ended up fracturing the, um, my femoral neck. And so did you know right away that's what it was, a stress fracture? I I assumed that it could be because, like, I literally was laying on the floor and, like, it hurt so bad to, like, move or do anything. Like, I couldn't barely get up. And I remember that evening, um, Dylan wanted to go for a walk. And I, like, walked, like, maybe 50 feet. And I was like, I can't walk anymore. Like, mm-hmm. this just hurts too bad. And that's, of course, right when Athens started walking. And so... It, after like a few weeks, I was like, okay, I'm just going to get an MRI. I'm going to confirm it. Cause like, it's not getting better. And then that way, at least I know what I can do and what I need to do. So I got the MRI and they were like, yep, you know, it's fractured, blah, 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 you know, six to eight weeks off. Like you should be on crutches. I was like, I can't be on crutches. <laughs> like <laughs> I have a baby. So yeah, it was terrible. Um, it was like 
terrible timing and just like a big, like stab in the heart to like everything I had worked for. I felt over the past, you know, six months, a year. I I can't help but wonder. It's like, cause obviously the injuries piling up that in and of itself is going to cause some like really some mental darkness. But do you think that any part of that time was like any sort of postpartum depression or anxiety? Like, do you think any, anything of it was maybe hormonal? Oh, so much of it was hormonal for me. Um, and that's something that like, again, I severely underestimated. I did not understand the hormone side and the shifting and, you know, I still feel not entirely normal with hormone stuff. And, you know, Athens is almost 20 months. So I really struggled. I wouldn't say a ton with like depression, but definitely with a lot of anxiety and possibly like irrational fears, I guess. So I remember when Athens was like first born and I kind of mentioned how like I, Dylan had to run beside me with the stroller because I couldn't not be around him. But then I remember like he was, Athens was sleeping and Dylan was holding him and he was probably like two or three months old at the time. And I was just one wall away in the garage doing an elliptigo ride. And I was just going to ride for 30 minutes in the garage and the like five or 10 minutes in, I just hear Athens screaming and screaming and screaming. And I get off and I like run inside and he was sleeping perfectly quiet and Dylan was holding him. And I was like, was he just crying? And Dylan's like, no, he's been perfectly no fine. Way. Like my mind just like was so freaked out that I like literally thought he was like screaming his head off Wow! and he was not at all. And so it was just so weird and so crazy. And then I would say, you know, when all of this stuff was happening, uh, with not being able to run and the stress fracture, I definitely had some hard times and some hard months where I was like, you know, really upset, really struggling, trying to find what I needed to do. And like, why am I, why am I doing this? And is it ever going to get better? And I guess I still wonder that I still wonder, like, is it ever going to go back to the way it was? Is it ever, am I ever going to be that, uh, runner that I was before I had a baby? Um, and there's so many like incredibly inspiring women out there who have kids and who have done it. And I started to realize like a lot of these women, it didn't happen in the first year after having a baby. You know, some people do, some people are able to run really well, but that seems to be more the exception than the norm. And so one of the things that I started thinking about was like, you know, look at Stephanie Bruce, like, yeah, she had some really great performances, you know, not long after having her kids, but it's literally been until her, her youngest was like four that she really had those races that she was excited about and proud of. And she had a lot of times where she was like, uh, like another crappy marathon, another, you know, race where I fell short of my goal and that type of thing. A lot of us are working from home right now and we find ourselves faced with plenty of uncertainty and brand new challenges, but On the bright side, most of us have plenty of time to run, and even though there may not be a ton of races on the horizon, everyday nutrition is more important than ever. And we're all looking for those daily energy sources that not only fuel our runs, but provide the kind of energy that lasts for hours. You can is nothing like those sodium and sugar-filled sports drinks that we grew up with. It's based on the premise of steady, long-lasting energy with no spike and no crash, which is exactly what we all want to fuel our day. I happen to know that my good friend and host of this podcast, Tina Muir, uses UCAN in her daily smoothies for a sustained energy boost. And I, I've been a big fan of UCAN for years. And personally, I can attest that it's a fantastic fuel source for training and racing. I, I've used UCAN in several marathons and have set many personal best using it as my primary fuel and recovery source. And a few years back, I decided to race the Chicago Marathon. And after doing a lot of research, I found UCAN online and I fell in love with the story behind the development of this product. And I decided I wanted to give it a shot. So I used it during all of my workouts that build up as a source of post-workout recovery. And of course, as my primary fuel source during the race. And that year 
I took 12 minutes off my personal best, dropping from 244 to 232 and finishing sixth place overall. And I've always believed that all runners should be students of the sport and give themselves every opportunity to be their best, especially in the field of nutrition. So I encourage you to do your research on this innovative company, their incredible origin story, and how they can help you become the best runner you can be. Use code TINAMUR25 to save 25% off your first order. Or if you're already a UCAN fan like me, save 15% with code TINAUCAN15. Look at Stephanie Bruce. Like, yeah, she had some really great performances not long after having her kids, but it's literally been until her, her youngest was like four that she really had those races that she was excited about and proud of. And she had a lot of times where she was like, uh, like another crappy marathon, another, you know, race where I fell short of my goal and that type of thing. Yeah. I think too, Neely, it's like, you know, you're so young. So I know people say this and it's annoying, but it's like, <laughs> you, you really are so young still. And I think about, you know, the women who did, we can't help but think about like, okay, Kara Goucher, who came back and ran 225 mm-hmm. six months later. But it's like, mm-hmm. then I remember, I think back to the podcast Tina did with Kara and Kara basically said, like, I regret jumping back into running as fast as I did. I don't remember yeah. that first year with my son. I have all these, mm-hmm. you know, so I, I really think at the end of the day, what's going to matter more is, is the, the mother that you were during this time and not the yeah. runner. But, um, it does help to know that, yeah, three out of the top eight women at the trials are mothers, you know, and, um, you look at like Helen and you know, her kid is now seven or eight or nine years old. I don't know how old, but, um, but yeah, it's like, there's a lot of years ahead of you and, um, and eventually you will turn a corner and you kind of already have, it's like, so like, when did that corner turn towards Houston? Like, when did all of a sudden things start clicking again? Yeah. Well, and so it's funny because I was, I was going to bring that up. So I, I had a terrible summer, right? Didn't run. And I started running September 1st. Um, and I started with 10 by run a minute, walk a minute, which was exactly what I did a year previous, um, (laughs) after I had had Athens and I was like, oh my gosh, like here I am, I'm starting over from the beginning. Like I thought, and I think a lot of my, like, a lot of my stress and like sadness, I guess was like mourning what I thought would be and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the year previous, I started my 10 by run a minute, walk a minute with such joy and hope and excitement because it was my first run back. And like, I had envisioned, you know, all these things to come. And then a year later, you know, I'm doing the exact same thing. And none of the things that I had envisioned actually happened. And so that was really hard for me. And then I started back and I was not feeling good at all. And I think, I think it was still a lot of hormone stuff. Um, and I've, I've talked about this previously, but I'll just bring it up again briefly. So like getting my period back after having a baby was awful. And I think as that started to regulate, it showed that my hormones were kind of returning to more of a normal homeostasis because each month that passed, uh, I would have less terrible symptoms. It would last for, you know, a shorter amount of time and I would feel more like myself. And so September was like really just a slow rebuilding October. I still was struggling, but I was at least running like four or five miles a day feeling half decent. And then it was just like November things just started clicking and I just started to feel so much better. And it was almost like an overnight, like shift happened. Mm -hmm. And that was the time where I was started to think like, okay, I, I miss this. I want to race again. And it was when all this talk of the trials was going on, you know, and everyone was qualifying at all the different races. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to run CIM. I'm going to do the relay, the half marathon, uh, relay, And I'm going to see if I can run pace for a half marathon. And if I can run pace for a half marathon in six weeks at Houston, I think I could try and go for it. And so I went into, um, CIM with just the, like, let's just see what happens and end up running 608 pace at CIM. Um, and I had to run like 615 pace roughly to qualify for the trials. I got to um, ask, what did it feel like <laughs> lining up? Cause that was the first time you'd lined up for a race in a couple of years. Like, what did that feel like? Yeah. 
it was so exciting. It was so funny because my husband ran the full marathon. And so we're like in the bus on the way to the start line together. And he's like all in the zone and all the stuff. And I'm just like, oh my God, I have pre-race nerves. And I forgot how (laughs) cool this was. Like, I love pre-race nerves. And he was like, what is wrong with you? And then, you know, we like get there and I'm like stretching and doing all my stuff. And I'm like trying to remember my timeline for like, when do I eat? How much do I drink? You know, like, um, when do I warm up and all these things? And he was just like, oh my God, like, this is why I can't ever race whenever you're racing because <laughs> we like handle pre-race very, very differently. Oh yeah. Um, and like his pre-race routine, like stresses me out so much because he's just like, so blah about everything. And my pre-race routine like stresses him out so much. And so anyways, we just shouldn't race the same race ever, but Um, it was, it was like so much fun and I had missed so much of that, like excitement and everything. So when I got to race, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Frankly, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm totally shocked that you were able to run 608 (laughs) pace after running, basically run walking for, you know, oh my gosh, that's crazy. I I was shocked too. Um, it, it doesn't quite make sense, but, um, that is the beauty of altitude versus sea level. So riding the bike, baby, it comes back. (laughs) Yeah. That, that definitely helped. Um, Um, and yeah, like I wore trainers, like I hadn't worn flats, you know, in like two years. So I was like, there's no way I'm putting flats on. Like, that sounds like a terrible idea and all this stuff. Um, so then I was able to like get super excited and kind of buckle down and like training looks so different in those six weeks between CIM and Houston. Um, I think I peaked at 74 miles, which, you know, typically I would peak at like a hundred, 110. I had to do my long run, like my big long run on the treadmill because it snowed. And so I was just like, Hey, it's heat training. Like it'll be fine. Like, don't worry about it. And so I had to talk myself through a lot of it. And it was like, I knew like, typically I'm someone that I like to race when I'm ready to race and I'm ready to go for it. And so it's been a really new and like challenging, but in a good way, transition, um, to releasing postpartum where I know I'm not my fittest. I know I'm not my strongest. I know I haven't put in the work that makes me feel I'm ready to go, but I have such a joy of towing the line and being there. And I was so proud of my race at Houston, um, and accomplishing that goal of qualifying for the third time. There's something so vulnerable about that. And that'd be hard enough, even if you weren't a professional runner, but it's like most, most women make this journey without having tens of thousands of followers who have eyes on them. You know, how much like fan or audience pressure did you feel going into Houston of like, I have to hit this to not let people down? Like, did you have those thoughts behind you going in? Well, it's funny because I really wanted it to be like totally under the radar. No one knows like all this stuff. And so when I called my agent, you know, I was like, okay, look, like I want to do this. I think I can do it. But like, let's not make a big deal about it. And he's like, all right, sounds good. So I like, you know, I, I didn't even, um, initially get in the like elite field. I was in the like sub elite field for Houston. And so it was like, all I got was a bib number. And like two weeks before Houston, I ended up getting into the elite field because someone backed out. And so I was able to have bottles as well, which was helpful, but I had like trained carrying a water bottle, you know, like I had, I had like a little gel pack, Mm -hmm. um, where I like had, you know, a fanny pack with like my gels in it. And I (laughs) practiced like all these things that like, you know, obviously I've taken for granted over the years. Um, but I was just like everyone else, like putting in the work and, you know, practicing the best of my ability. And so it was, it was about two weeks out right at that time where they told me like, Oh, you can be in the elite field. They were also like, and we want you in the press conference. And I was like, what? Like, why me? And they literally said what you said, Sarah, they're like, because you're relatable. Like we have Africans who are going to run and they're going to run super fast and it's going to be awesome. But like, you're relatable. Your story is going to speak to so many more people because the majority of people who are runners are moms and yeah. women. And so they were like, we want, we want to share it. And I was like, okay, like I can do this, That that's fine. Like it'll be fine. And so I started to have a lot more pressure put on me, I guess. Um, and my whole idea of like flying under the radar where no one would know like quickly 
ended (laughs) and I was like, okay, like I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to say, this is my goal and this is what I want to do. And I'm going to have to be okay if it doesn't happen. And like the people who support you through the, the good and the bad are the ones that matter. And that's all that I can focus on right now. So I loved everything about the Houston marathon weekend. And it was very fortunate that I met that goal and I ran 244, but I crossed the finish line and I thought I would have this like incredible sense of accomplishment and like tears of joy. And it honestly was just like, thank God I did it. And it was like, <laughs> just relief. huge relief. Yeah. And it yeah. was, I didn't realize until I crossed the finish line, how much stress I had Yeah, and how like, I guess, yeah. How much I had shouldered. Well, it's one thing it's, it's scary enough to go into a race, even when you know you're fit, because a lot of things can go wrong in a marathon, but you had to be worried going in about, okay, at some point in the race, like the lack of endurance is going to catch up with me. So at what yes. point in the race, did you know you were actually going to do it? About one mile to go. Well, you're kidding. You're kidding. Cause at that point no. you're probably like, okay, the wheels could fall off any moment. Right. <laughs> yes. And they were falling off, but I felt like I had enough of a bubble that even if they fell off a little bit, that it was still going to be okay. So I felt amazing, really good, really relaxed, really comfortable until mile 18. And at mile 18, it was like, and yes, like I can feel the lack of miles in my legs. I can feel the lack of long runs. I can feel that I've only trained six weeks for this race. Um, you know, when I'm someone who, I love a long buildup. I'm the like, let's do a 20 week buildup into a marathon type person. Um, where some people are like eight, 10, 12 weeks. That's great. No, I'm the person that wants like a solid four to five months of preparation. So (laughs) for me to have only like four to five weeks and then a taper, I was like, Oh God, okay, we can do this. Like, it's going to be all right. Man. And so, yeah, I really, and at that point I was like, Hey, like, I just have to stay focused. I have to put one foot in front of the other, just stay as calm and relaxed as possible. And so that's what I did. And around mile 20, I started to be like, okay, like I, we only had, I was running with the pacer and like the, the pack that was going for that sub two forty five Olympic trials qualifier. And we only had like a 20 second bubble at that point where like nothing could go wrong. And I was like, okay, like I need to break away and I need to start like chipping away at that to give myself a little bit more, uh, wiggle room. And so around 20, I started to do that. And I just kind of picked up the pace a little bit and I pulled away from them a bit. Uh, A few, a couple people went with me and then I was rolling till about 23 and around 23, I was like, okay, I, I think I can just maintain at this point. Like, I don't think I can pick it up anymore. And so I found someone and you probably heard all about this story when you listen to, to Allie's podcast with it. Um, but it was orange shirt guy. And so (laughs) I got to run and I, I literally just tucked in behind this guy who I then thanked, um, after, and, uh, was like, I so appreciate you doing all that work and just dragging me along. Cause that's all I could do. Yep. I just yep. needed someone to tuck in behind and not think and just go through the motion. And so right around one mile to go, um, he like, he was encouraging me and, um, that's when I knew like, okay, like we're going to make it, we're going to get to the finish line. Like this goal is a reality. And I knew that the pace group had to pass me. So I knew that we were still under pace and everything. And so when we got to like the final stretch, he was just like, this is your time. You did it. Like celebrate. You got this. And I was just like, no, I don't like the finish line is still 10 feet away. I don't got this yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but once I crossed it, I did. Um, And it was great. It was like such a great feeling to be able to set a goal and meet a goal. And that's something that I hadn't felt in a long time, you know, and that's something that I was dealing with prior to getting pregnant was like, I had these goals and now my foot hurts and I can't do them. And like, I hate running because like, I feel like my body's just not working with me. And this feels like it's something out of my control. Like these goals that I had, you know, just crumbled and that was it. And so it was such a great feeling to be like, I set this goal and I met it. Um, and yeah, 
yeah. it's still exciting for me to talk about, I guess. You know, I, I've really, I thought about it a lot watching the trials this year about how many women qualified and how for a lot of them that getting to the trials and, you know, running the trials, that was just another race. Like really, truly the more important thing was the journey. And I think of anyone mm-hmm. on that line, it's like your journey was rocky, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just getting there. And it's just, Oh my gosh. It's such an incredible story to hear. Um, and now I'm curious, it's like right now, having gone through that, having gone to the trials and everything, if you could go back and talk to that Neely from a couple years ago, holding that positive pregnancy test, what would you tell her? Like, what advice would you give her, um, you know, about the next couple of years? Like, what would you warn her about? You know? Yeah. The first thing I would say is I knew not to have expectations. I knew that, you know, pregnancy means that your body is not your own, that when you're breastfeeding and caring for a baby, your body is not your own. Um, but I, I really think that slowing things down and like, I thought I had this really great, like slow, easy, very, um, like sure, like progression plan for my return to running and my return to racing. And I think I should have not even had expectations for that and not had as much of a plan and like, a okay, at six months I do this and at three months I do this. And, you know, like, I think that, um, it would have been way better if I was just like, my goal is to listen to my body. Mm -hmm. My goal is to take it one day at a time. And my goal is to not put any races on the calendar until I wake up one morning and I say, I am fit, I am ready, and I'm excited to race. Um, instead, I feel like I kind of got to a point where it's like, okay, like I've hit this point. Now I have to be focused. I have to be dedicated. I have to run this many miles a week. I have to do two workouts a week. I need to get my long run to this distance. And so at that point is when I think things started to fall apart was because I was starting to force the process. And so that's like one of my big, um, mantras that I always use is like, trust the process. And I think that's like so essential to pregnancy and to the comeback and the return to running. And it was actually super helpful at my one year, uh, OB checkup after having Athens. Um, she was like, so how's everything going? And I was like, I'm so frustrated. Like I thought I'd be in a different place than I am with running and everything. And she's like, you know, it takes up to four years for your body to fully recover on the cellular level after having a baby. And I was like, what? Four yeah. years? And she's no one like, tells you that. <laughs> she's like, yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, I always heard, you know, like nine months in, nine months out, like don't expect to feel like yourself until they're nine months old. And I was like, yeah, at nine months out, like I still felt very, very far from myself. And she's like, you got to be patient, like slow things down. It's, it's going to be fine. But, and so that was like so amazing and incredible to hear. Um, and so I just want to make sure that that message is put out there. Like there's a lot of things that are out of your control, like the hormone stuff. It's so out of your control, you know, whether or not you are a working parent or you're staying at home, each has its own challenges and its benefits. And, you know, whether you have uh, like multiple kids or you're just figuring it all out with the first one, like there's so many changes and, um, so many new stresses and so many new joys. And, uh, for me, like I, I love being present and I love being the the main caretaker for Athens. And it has come with me shouldering a lot of things that I know I can't train to the full level that I was able to do before, even if I, even if my body would let me right now but that doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. And so that's kind of my goal, like moving forward, you know, I've talked a lot about like all of these like terrible things. And yeah, when I was lining up against all the women on the starting line of the trials, it was incredible. Cause I was like, every single woman had their ups and downs to get here. Every single person has a story. Every single person like has worked really hard to make this goal happen for themselves. And it was such a like amazing and empowering feeling to be running alongside all of those women and things didn't go my way between Houston and the trials. I had hoped that my body would cooperate and I'd be able to run the entire trials. And, you know, that 
Houston would just feel like kind of a hard long run effort, but neither of those is true. I poured a lot into Houston and my body was not ready to bounce right back into training. And so I had to listen to it and I, and I did, and I'm so proud of myself for doing that because, um, you know, I had the goal of towing the line and being at the trials. And I literally wrote that goal down, um, while I was pregnant with Athens, I wrote the goal. My number one goal after having Athens is to qualify and run at the Olympic trials. And I did just that next time I'll have to be a little more specific, um, run the whole (laughs) way at the trials. Um, but you know, I, I could check that goal off still. And so I did. Um, but it doesn't have to be all like, uh, gloom and doom and like just focused on the downs. I do want to like emphasize that, that there were, and are so many ups and so many exciting things. And, um, you know, I'm just going to be patient. And my goal is to kind of see what happens over the next four years and hopefully train through 2024. And like, this was my, you know, first time towing the line at the Olympic trials, my third time qualifying. And so hopefully next time I get to run the whole thing and I can be competitive the way I want to be. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm along with a lot of people, I'm very excited to see what this new mindset does, especially as your body um, returns to that pre-pregnancy state. It's going to be really great. Um, so we are just about out of time, but I have a couple of super fun lightning round questions for you just to end things on a light note. Are you ready? Yeah. These are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And I like to be really cruel with these. So the first one, this one's tricky because you only get a very slight benefit. So the, the thing is right now you could go run a one minute marathon PR. So it's a PR, not a lot, but it's a minute. But along the way at every aid station, you have to chug a mug of hot clam chowder. Would you do it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, same. Okay, next one. And I gave this one to Tina. This one's actually really hard. Um, Okay, so the world record in the marathon is now 214. You have an option here. You can go run a world record 213 in practice, but you can never tell a soul. No one will ever know that you did it. Or you can go run a 225 publicly. What do you do? The 225, 100%. Publicly. Yeah, I know. All of us would be like, oh yeah, I'd love to run in. But no, like we want people to know that we did it. I'm glad you're honest about that. Um, the last two have nothing to do with running. Uh, would you rather lose all of your teeth or all of your hair? All my hair. Same, you could just get a wig. Um, and then would you rather wrestle an alligator or a bear? A bear. I was totally thinking you'd pick alligator. Yeah, I don't know. Alligators kind of creep me out. So I think, I think a bear would be better because at least you have usually like those, you know, if it's a grizzly bear, you like play dead, but if it's a brown bear, you get big. So like, I, I could like pull on some of those things that like I learned, you know, yeah, no one ever really gives us alligator tips except uh, Steve Irwin. And that didn't end up so well for him. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, Neely, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time with me today. It was just incredible. And especially being pregnant right now, like it was wonderful to, um, to hear your journey. And I took a lot of inspiration from, and I'm sure others have as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you so much for chatting. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. I just love that. That was so nice for me listening to two friends talking and kind of catching up and and hearing Neely's story in her own words over the last you know few years. Um, as she said, it didn't really go how things expected her to. And I think that's a very, very common finding when you have a child. So Sarah will have to let us know if she follows along with that same trajectory and hopefully she can learn from the rest of us and kind of maybe make not make some of the mistakes that we did but I really appreciate Neely's vulnerability and just her ability to to share the honest truth if you don't follow either of those you should go follow Sarah and Neely you can find links to the, in the show notes to both of their social media accounts 
and to everything they talked about today at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 190. You can also find links to our sponsors in the show notes, which you supporting them also supports me. I really appreciate any time you purchase those products. That really gives me a massive thumbs up and helps keep me in business as a small business. This is a tough year for me, but I appreciate your support. And my friends, next week, I am excited that I will be bringing on Katie Arnold on the show. Many of you have recommended her over the years. She is an ultra runner. She's written the book Running Home, which is a very popular book. If you haven't read it already, you probably will want to after this episode. I will be back in the interviewing seat next week to record that episode. So um, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Sarah. Her next episode she will be doing will be with Matt Fitzgerald on July 10th. So you can look forward to that one. And if you are a new listener, I hope you will hit the subscribe button and come join us for future episodes. Thank you so much to Neely and Sarah. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.